All right, we are going to be in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 6. We've been going through the Bible. We started in Genesis chapter 1, I don't know, three years ago or so. And now we're in 1 Samuel chapter 6. What a blessing to have the Word of God. Know what He thinks about things. Understand how He responds to things. It surely is a blessing. Let's, let's, can we pray one more time? Father, thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. I pray now that you'd help us to yield ourselves to it. I pray, Father, that you'd help us to find in it what we need for today. Lord, I pray that your Spirit would move and guide, direct. Lord, bear witness to the truth. Help us to see and understand truth. I pray, God, we would not just see it, understand it, but also apply it. We ask these things in the Lord Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Last, last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the story. Uh, really, it's, it's not been Samuel a whole lot. Uh, we saw the birth of Samuel. We saw Eli being the problem that he is, and the nation as a whole being in the, in the condition or the predicament that they have found themselves in because of their rejection of the Lord. Now, there's something that the Bible gives us in principle that we see even in today's day and time, and that is this. God's people are held to a very high standard. If you're a child of God and you know the Lord, there is a standard for you that is different than the world. And the reason for that is because you have the word of God, you have an indwelling spirit of God, and therefore God's going to say, hey, because you have all of these things, the Bible says, to whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. All right, and that means the more that you know of the word of God, the more scriptures you know, the more you are accountable to accomplish what the Lord would have for you to do. Now, that's, that's very difficult to do in your own power and your own strength. But what God has so done is he has given us his spirit to enable us to do exactly what it is that he would have for us to do. And so what we find in the nation of Israel, in a practical sense, the same thing, is that they have been given the law of God. They have watched God move in their life. They watched God part the Red Sea. They watched God feed them miraculously for 40 years in the wilderness. They watched him part the Jordan River. And I'm, and I'm leaving a lot of things out. But they watched, like, there's no question that God is real and God is for them. And yet, time after time, you find in the, in the history of the nation of Israel that there are times where they have turned their back on God. This is such that time where they have a high priest, but the high priest refuses to do right. He's got children. The Bible says in, I think it's chapter 3, his children made themselves vile. Like, that's some strong statements. And the high priest did nothing about it. And so we find God's judgment is on them. So they go to battle. The ark of God is taken by the Philistines. And even though they deserve to have lost everything, God isn't going to have it. God's like, no, we're not going to let the Philistines keep the ark. And so he judges the Philistines. We looked at that last week. And now we're in chapter 6 of 1 Samuel. We, we pick up in verse 13. We saw how the Philistines, uh, in, their, in their wisdom, brought back the ark of God to the nation of Israel. And in verse 13, we find they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. Look, guess what we had to do? Nothing. And God brought it back. Isn't it amazing how God just does things without us? It is incredible. I think it is. Because they, they didn't deserve to, they deserved to have lost it. They took it with the mentality that this ark, remember, it will deliver us. It won't do anything. It, a representation of something else, yet it is a very important piece in the nation of Israel. I mean, it holds value to them, it holds value to God, I'll, I'll say. That's why God so brought it back, verse 14, and the ark and the cart came into the field of Joshua, a Beth Shemite, and stood there, where there was a great stone. This is incredible, because... Remember the, the story we looked at last week, how the, how the Philistines, they made a new cart. They put the ark of God on a new cart. They put in, in, on that cart a coffer full of those golden imrods and the golden mice. And they took two milk kine. They locked up their, their young and they sent them down the road. And it wasn't a short trip. And those, those cows didn't turn left. They didn't turn right. They didn't go feed their young. They went right 
where God told them to go. And then we find here, they hadn't stopped. They didn't turn anywhere. And in verse 14, they stood there. Like they knew when it was time to stop. Like I understand, listen, and understand the principle that I'm trying to make. It is something how God can so control an animal to know when to turn and when to go straight and when to avoid what the natural inclination is. A natural inclination for a milk kind is to go back and feed its young. That's natural inclination. Do you know that people have natural inclination as well? I naturally want to do things that appease my flesh. I naturally want to do things that make me happy. And yet if I'm yielded to God as these cows were, I know it's not time for that. Right? There's a time and there's a place for everything, we understand. But there's a time when God is right and where I'm going to follow the Lord and I'm going to stop when he says stop and I'm going to go straight when he says go straight. I understand we're, we're talking about cows. Would God, his people, would be so yielded that would, they wouldn't do what's natural. They would do what is natural for a believer, which is different than natural for the natural man. Now notice what we find in, at the end of verse 14. And they clave the wood of the cart and offered the kind a burnt offering unto the Lord. Uh, one more time, we'll look at these, these cows and say, what a, what a privilege for them to be so in the service of God and to be offered. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. They, they are following the Lord, and they're not, obviously they're animals, so we're going to, you know, you can only use this example as far as it goes. But they're, they're sacrificed to God because they weren't too good for it. There are people who have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and they're too good to offer themselves to the Lord. And that's a shame. Verse 15, And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was with it, wherein the jewels of gold were, and put them on the great stone, and the of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. This is where we go south. It's very important we understand. Looks like they're serving God and they're doing exactly what God would have them to do, but it's not true. Because the Lord, he, specifically, take your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12. Hold your place there, we're coming back. We get excited sometimes in the service of the Lord. This happens in today's day and time where people get, you know, they're so in, entrenched into what God is doing that they start going rogue. They start doing it their way. Well, it's for the Lord. Be careful we don't offer to the Lord what he didn't want. Be careful we don't do things, quote unquote, for the Lord that he said he didn't want. Okay, we offer like our, our society is full of people who offer music to God that he is not for. It's not an offering to God at all. He's not for it. So, you know, I, I use this example all the time and I, and I don't, but praise the Lord. I, I, I'm going to beat this dead horse until I'm dead. So you might as well get used to it now. Amen. I don't, I don't bring my wife home things she doesn't like and say, hey, this is for you. Right? Because she, why would she appreciate that? I don't, you know what, I don't give my children things for their birthday that they don't, need or want. Why? So Christianity has become about us. In many churches, it's about us. And the Lord said, why are you bringing this to me? That's what you want. That's not what I want. Don't bring to God what you want. Don't serve God your way. He already said what is his way. So we do it his way. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 12. Look at verse 13. Take heed. Oh, Take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest, but in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of thy tribes. There shalt thou offer thy burnt offerings, and there thou shalt do all that I command thee. You don't get to just say, well, here, here's a good place. We'll just make this be church. We'll make this be the worship center for us. We're excited about what God did, so let's go ahead and what starts as a great day ends as a terrible day 
in Israel. And it starts when we start going rogue in our mind and thinking that we have, oh, we could just do what we want. It feels right. You know how many things in your life are going to feel right that are wrong? Count them. It's a lot. Doesn't matter that it feels right. What did God say? Go back to our passage. And the Levites, verse 15, took down the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was with it, wherein the jewels of gold were, and put them on a great stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrifice, sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. Verse 16, and when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. So they, they returned, they're trying to appease God. If you remember, God is destroying them. So they're appeasing the Lord. Hey, it's back where it goes. We're out. Okay? They're still pagans. They're still idolaters. They're not looking at everything that's going on and thinking, how is this going to end? And that, my friends, is a blessing. Because sometimes the world looks on at God's people. And you know what they witness? They have to witness God's judgment. And it's a bad testimony of the glory of God. If the Philistines stayed and watched what happened next, it would be like, they would almost think, wow, I guess God's not for us. Because God's about to destroy. In verse 17, and these are the golden emeralds which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord. Again, I don't know what that looks like. Um, I've never seen an image of a, of a golden emerald. Uh, I'm sure there one exists. One for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for, for Ascalon, one for Gath, and one for Ekron. And the golden mice, which most people assume that there are five, but if you look at verse 18, that there's, there, there are many more. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both of fenced cities and of country villages, even unto the great stone of Abel, whereon they set down the ark of the Lord, which stone remain unto this day in the field of Joshua the Bethshemite. So it looks like the golden mice, there's more than five. It's not just for the, for the lords. The emeralds were for the lords, but the mice were for every city that they governed. And it said not just the cities, but also look, it said in verse 18, and country villages. So we, we're seeing a lot more than that. I know that's a little, little, it's a side note, if you will, but as we read the Bible, we're going to glean not just what, what we always hear taught, because in my whole life, it's five and five. But you read the verse, it's not. It's, it's, it's plenty more. Amen? Verse 19. This is a strange transition, but we're going to get verse 19. God wrote this. Here's what the Philistines offered. Here's what God did. And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people 50,000 Three score and ten men. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. So here's a great day. And I'm not saying it's because they offered. Obviously, it's not because they offered. It's because they went further than that. Sometimes people get comfortable doing their thing, and then they go further than that. I think, well, we're doing this for the Lord. We're offering for the Lord. God clearly is on our side. He brought the ark back to us. Hey, Let's take some liberties here. And God said no. And he killed 50,070 people. And that's a lot of people. Because they looked into the ark of God. And, and you think, well, why wouldn't you be able to do that? It's because God said no. You ever wonder why we can't do certain things? I know we talked about this just last week. I believe we talked about liberty. Where our liberty ends. Right? People cry. Liberty, we have liberty. Praise God for Christians. I'm so thankful I'm not under that law. I'm so thankful that I don't have to be terrified that God's going to wipe me out tomorrow because I'm a knucklehead. I'm thankful. I, I truly am. I'm thankful. I appreciate that. I live in a different time. I, I, praise the Lord. But liberty has its boundaries. Our, our, our boundaries are further on than theirs. Again, I'm thankful. Like, I love bacon. Amen. 
I'm thankful to be in an age of grace. I, I appreciate it. Okay, now, if the Lord said you can't eat that, would I, would I be upset? Probably not. You know, does it matter? No, but I appreciate it. Amen? There are things that we enjoy and we just take for granted, but they, they couldn't enjoy back then. The fact that, and we talked about this last Sunday morning, the fact that we can be reconciled to God, have direct access to the Father. Do you understand? They couldn't do that. Most of these people, probably every one of these people, had never seen the ark of God before without its covering. They see it, they're like, wow, this is, this is so neat. Look, we've never been able to see this thing because God was unapproachable to the nation of Israel. It's not like they could just go in there and see that whenever they wanted. So here it is. That doesn't mean we can do what we want. And so God has to make an example of these people in this case. If you would, take your Bible to Leviticus. Chapter 10. Sometimes we wonder why the Lord puts these stories in the Bible. Lord, why would you write that you just you killed 50,070 people? Because the intent is that people would fear the Lord and follow God, especially when you're under the law. Right? Now, I think it shouldn't be different for us who are not under the law. I think we should be more apt because not only do we have what God would have for us, but we also have the power of the Holy Spirit of God to do it. So it's easier for us to accomplish what God said than it was for them. But it seems like, now I could be wrong, but it seems like our generation is less apt to try than they were. Seems like. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not blanketing that for every person I've ever met, but as a whole. Look at ch chapter 10, verse 1. The Bible says this, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, wow, priest took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. So they did what he said don't do. You know what they did in our chapter? They did what he said don't do. Well, it felt right. It was wrong. Verse 2, And there went out a fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people, I will be glorified. I will be, because I'm God. So when you get to our passage and you find that they decide, oh, we're going to look in the Ark of the Covenant. We want to see what's in there. God said, I will be glorified. I will be sanctified. You, you don't. This is, the lesson for us is this. Come back to our passage. The lesson for us is this. Sometimes the scenario lands different than we expected that it would land. That doesn't change right and wrong. I cannot tell you how many times I have heard fools speak to me and justify why it's okay that they do what they're doing. Well, you don't, you don't understand what she did. I don't really care. Why, why are we justifying bad behavior? God, God holds us to a standard and he didn't say, well, yeah, I didn't see that coming. You, man, you're right. I didn't know your husband was going to be a knucklehead. Yes, he did. He still set the standard. Amen. Where were we? Okay, verse 19. And he smote them of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people 50,000. This is a great number. And three score and ten men. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. And verse 20, and the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go up from us? Now, here, I've heard this, not that, that exact statement, but I've heard statements like this from God's people. The way of the Lord is so hard. It's a perspective thing. Do you know how to avoid killing 50,070 people? Don't disobey. Did that sound real hard? 
I'm not trying to, I, I know I come across very, very often as a smart aleck. I'm not trying to be. I'm trying to just be like realistic. Okay? It wasn't really hard to avoid this problem. It's not like, oh no, God did wrong. He didn't do wrong. He did what he said he was going to do. He said, I will be justified. I will be glorified. You did wrong. Wow. You know, sometimes I read the Bible, it's just so hard. It's not that hard. It's hard because you want to do two things. It's hard because, I, well, I want the Lord to be happy, but I also want me to be more happy. That's what's hard. If you're trying to live two lives at the same time, it's not going to work. It can't work. It's impossible. And so the carnal Christian will say, I just, I can't do what God wants. No, you can't do what God wants and what you want. You're not actually saying you can't do what God wants. You just can't do what you want too. Therefore, like, I can't. How do we stand before God when every time we disobey, he does something about it? You know? How? how, how? Well, if that's the question, that's the right question. But they, they left out a big, their question left out a big problem. The problem was, oh yeah, we did wrong. God did right. How are we going to stand before him? Go back to chapter 3. Well, look at, look at chapter 4. That's what I meant to say. My memory's not as good as it used to be. Chapter 4. I just, I just, I'm bringing this by, by way of remembrance. We've already looked at chapter 4. I understand that. But look at verse 2. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel, and when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. So 4,000 Israelites died. In battle against the Philistines. And the next verse. And when the people were coming to the camp. The elders of Israel said. Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Why, why did we lose? I don't understand. And they, they gave credit to where it belongs. God did that. Like, why did God let us lose? Well God let you lose. We're going to see it in the next chapter here in a few minutes. God let you lose because you were disobedient. And that you're following yourself. And you're following false gods. And, and you're not serving the Lord. And so he's trying to get your attention. Okay, but the question is, wh why? And then we get to verse, oh, verse 10. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent, and there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were slain. And there ran man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent with the earth upon his head. And when he came low, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. So the city is weeping. They're mourning. They're, they're. When 4,000 people died, they said, wherefore hath the Lord smitten us? Why would God do this? 30,000 more people died. It's a, it's a problem. But, but God is trying, I mean, he's dealing with a nation. And he says, y'all need to fix it. All of the people that died in battle against the Philistines doesn't touch what God does when he deals with them personally and says, don't you do that. Isn't that incredible? I think of David, and we're going to get here in 2 Samuel, when David numbered the people. And the prophet goes to David and says, well, you've got three options. You know, David said, I'm going to fall into the hand of the Lord. I don't, I don't want to be smitten before mine enemies. I want to be, I want, this is between God and me. Now, lots of people died for that one, too. Because God doesn't, he doesn't just let things go. Every, every sin must be paid for, every one of them. And so God, he holds accountable his people when they will not obey. Now come back to our passage, chapter 6, the very end there. We see, oh, who can stand? Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go from, up from us? 
That, that speaks of God and who He is. We can actually stand before the Lord in the righteousness of Christ when we follow the Lord. This, this mentality, the, the Bible is, oh, I love the Bible because it's so balanced. Because you can read the Bible and you can be, oh, God is just judgment and God is wrath and God, everything. Every time you turn around in the Old Testament, God is killing people. You can. That's a false balance. The balance of the Bible is this. And then God is slow to, mer- slow to anger, plenteous in mercy, full of grace and compassion. And that he would send his own son to die on a cross for your sins. That's incredible. To see the balance of God. People, was well, God just up, up in heaven with a hammer waiting? He's not, actually. But the hammer's there. Should he need it? Because we're hard-headed and hard-hearted and stiff-necked at times. It might be that God has to drop a hammer. I don't want it. But guess what? Neither does God. You think God's waiting just, oh, I just can't wait to kill another 50,000? That's not what God is. You know what God would rather? You do right. Let me bless you. Why should I have to have the Philistines run your life for 70 years? Why, Why should that be the case? It shouldn't be. It's because they wouldn't do right. So God isn't a hammer. He's not just wrath. He's balanced. Just like every parent should be, right? You can't let your children get away with anything. How are they going to be a productive member of society later? you got to teach them something. That's what God does on a national level. And it looks like a big deal, but that's not what he preferred. And I'll show you that. Look at chapter 7. And the men of kirjath Jerem came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. I want you to notice something, and we're going to move, move through these a little bit faster. This is something that they took more seriously. We didn't just set it aside and start offering and doing our own thing. He sanctified someone to keep it. You see that? It wasn't just like... Just throw it in a closet somewhere, hide it. No, somebody is going to to minister before this thing, and that person is set aside to do that job, which means this this family, Abinadab's family, is taking it seriously. Verse 2, and it came to pass, while the ark abode in Kirjath Jerem, that the time was long, for it was 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. It's a long time. They're lamenting after the Lord. They're mourning. Verse 3, and Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, here's a condition. I just, this is Samuel. Now, Samuel's not really been on the scene much. We haven't seen much of Samuel. This is actually where he starts to come out, and we see a lot of him as a great prophet of God. But he's dealing, the first thing that Samuel deals with is the condition of the nation. The first thing he wants to do, hey, we can follow God. It doesn't have to be the way that it's been. You understand, if you live a life of constant defeat, it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, that's just the wonderful truth. The nation of Israel has lived for decades. I mean, since the time of Samson, they have lived in defeat under the thumb of the Philistines. That's where they lived. And it it gets to the point where it's just natural. It's like, well, this is just the way it's always been. I don't know what it's like not to be defeated. Can I say, it don't have to be that way? There are are children of God, and yes, they are children of God. They're saved. They're born again. They're on their way to heaven. Praise God. But they live a life in bondage. It doesn't have to be that way. You think the Lord, he came, I know, I I know, I'm going to teach. It's not common. There is so much more in the Bible about delivery from sin than there ever is. You couldn't find a verse, a single verse in the Bible that says, you want to go to heaven when you die. You can't, you can't find it. It's not there. You know what you will find in the Bible all over the place? Delivery from sin. All over the place. Constantly. Oh, don't you want to go to heaven? Just say these few words. Garbage. It's trash. 
Because there are so many people who will say these few words and never have been saved. Because they weren't dealt with the problem. The problem isn't your location or your destination. The problem is sin. And that's what God delivers from, sin. So, amen. Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Do you see? We're only four verses in from the last. I mean, he just destroyed 50,070 people, right? And now Samuel comes in and says, you know what you can do? You can be delivered. There's a mentality of people who just don't understand the deliverance in Christ. It's deliverance. You can look at the Bible and you can say, I, I can't keep all these rules. I don't know why God is so hard. Or you can say, you mean to tell me I don't have to serve sin? Go to Romans chapter 6. Samuel, is, he's putting something on them. He's saying, look, you don't, you don't have to stay in the, in the bondage you're in. You don't have to live a defeated life. Did you know that God's people don't have to be defeated? Countless, countless lost people out there, they don't want to be miserable. Did you know you don't, people don't want to be miserable. They just don't know how not to be. It's just true. If you could guarantee them a way to, to, to get out of their misery, and it was a way that which they would agree, they would do it. The problem is that agree thing. I got to agree with God. Look, look at verse, because in our passage, I'm going to go back, you, you can stay right there. I'm just going to remind myself where, why I'm going here, because I forgot. Okay, verse, verse 3. If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods. Okay, so why are they defeated? In chapter 4, wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Why are we defeated? Well, we're defeated because we're not serving the one we're supposed to be serving. We're serving false gods. We're serving ourself. We're serving our religion. But we're not serving the Lord. And so he says in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? You know what, you know what Paul's saying here? He says, did you know that you are the servant of who you make yourself the servant of? That's some deep stuff. But guess what you are? Every person in the planet, you know what they are? They're a slave to something. They are. Every one of us. People say, oh, I'm my own man. Really? Because I'm looking, and it looks like you're a slave to fashion. You're a slave to your job. You're, you know, pe people, they want to claim that they're their own, but they're not. Nobody is their own. And Paul said, here's the thing. You're a servant of sin, or you're a servant of righteousness. And that's the only two things there are. That's wonderful. Verse 17, but God be thanked. That ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin. Ye became the servants of righteousness. Well, I just went from one master to another. Now, that doesn't appeal to some people. It appeals to me because one of them is miserable and one of them is joyous. One of them is a cruel taskmaster and one of them will fight my battles for me. You know what Samuel said in, in, in our chapter? He didn't say, don't serve anything. He said, look, put away the false gods. Put away the garbage. Serve just the Lord, and the Lord will do something for you. That's what he said. That's incredible. Because that's exactly what we find in, our past, in, in, in Romans chapter 6. He said, you're, you're, the, you're a servant of whoever you make yourself a servant, but God be thanked because when you serve righteousness, God is there for you. 
Look at verse 14. I skipped it on purpose. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What a contrast. Do you understand the contrast that's given there? Where God says, you are a servant of sin, but I'm giving grace. Now, we understand that's a servant of righteousness. I understand that. But wow, it's better. It's so much better. Why, why would I remain in bondage to something that makes me a slave to misery when the Lord himself offers grace and truth, peace and satisfaction and joy? Why would I, why would I stick with sin? It doesn't even make sense. Look at 1 Samuel 7. Now, the reason I brought that to our attention is because of this. That's the spiritual application to what we find in 1 Samuel 7. 1 Samuel 7 is, is a practical passage, but there is a spiritual application. So he says, if ye will, in, in verse 3, and Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, if ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts. Side bonus. It never works halfway. Never. I can't say, Lord, here's, here's a piece of me. Do what you can with it. It's not going to work. It never will. But if I will with all my heart say, Lord, here I am. What can you do with this? And man, there's no limit to what he can do with it. So that's, that's the, the caveat. He says, if you do return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange God and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts to serve the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistine. So if you serve God, he'll do something for you. There's no other, there's no other servant, slave, master relationship that says, you do right, and I will pour out blessings on you. You can't find another false god in all the Bible where they said, well, we're going to serve Molech, and then he does something for them. Hey, we're going to serve Baal, and then he benefits us. Nothing. But God says, all you have to do, just, just follow the law. Just, just follow what I said and watch the blessings flow. There are, there are miserable Christians in this world. Did you know that? There might be one or two in here. Amen. I, can I say this? You don't have to be that way. If we will follow God, it's not like he wants to make you miserable. He's not waiting to kill 50,000 people. He's waiting to show himself mighty on behalf of those who trust him. That's the God I know of the Bible. Verse 4. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Man, this is just for me. Y'all have to catch up here. It is such a wonderful blessing when you give the counsel of the Bible and somebody takes it. Praise God. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be smart. I'm just saying it is... Like, there, is, there are a few things on the planet that will give more satisfaction than watching somebody obey the Bible. They say, look what God said. Pretend he's right for just a second and try it. And then they try it, and then he comes through. Man, there's something wonderful about that. That's what this passage is about. So in verse 4, the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. They said, okay, Samuel, let's try it that way. And they did it. And you know what they found? They're not disappointed. We are disappointed in our life when we don't do right. Verse 5. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. Here's what happens in this verse. Everything before this, it's exciting. Praise the Lord. They're, they're understanding that there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And no matter what you think, there's always a right and a wrong. Always. People think, well, you know, I just feel like hogwash. Okay? They're still right. They're still, even if you don't believe the Bible, people who don't even believe the Bible still think it's wrong to kill somebody. You know where that's found? It's found in the Bible. 
And God wrote it on your conscience. Like these things, they exist even for atheists or so-called atheists. I don't believe God believes in atheists. But, but we think, well, there's always a right and a wrong. So Samuel lays out a right way and a wrong way. And they say, you know what, let's try the right way. But it's not enough to just say, okay, we're going to put this away and we're going to serve the Lord. You know what they had to do? This is where people struggle. Uh, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. They got before the Lord and they said, we have sinned. We can't just pretend it didn't happen. Right? This is where that, that, that garbage salvation that exists today is. Where we just, like, we'll just turn a new leaf. That's not salvation. You've got to be honest with God. They had to be honest with God before God would fight on their behalf. They couldn't just pretend. Well, hey, see, there all the bad gods are gone, and here's just God. Now he'll just be just on our side again. No, 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 no. Samuel was careful to say several times, with all your heart, it ain't about what you outwardly do. I can put on any show you want to see. What's this heart tell me? And that, that matters to God more than what you do. Now, I think the Bible tells us Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Everything that's in the heart is what comes. That's, that's what's coming out. And Samuel judged Israel. Look at verse 7. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to mispee, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. You know what happens if you live a life of defeat? I, I, know, I know for a fact there are people who are afraid of certain temptations. Rightfully so. You fell for those temptations for decades. You ought to be afraid of them. But there's a point where the Philistines shouldn't stir up fear in the hearts of, the, of Israel anymore. It's okay today. Now, if it's going to happen again and again and again, we're going to see it. It, sh it shouldn't have happened after today. After chapter 7... God's in control. We're following God. I shouldn't fear that, that, that anymore. There are things that we shouldn't fear. Well, I, well, I, 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 why? Why are we afraid of something? Is God still on the throne? So they feared. But they had to. They've been in defeat under the thumb of the Philistines for decades. The last chapter we just read in chapter, in chapter 4, 34,000 people died at the hand of the Philistines. They took the ark of God. Like, yeah, we've only ever known, in the lifetime of every one of these people, they have only ever known defeat. Okay? And so that's, that's, that's a conditioned mindset. Doesn't have to be, but it is in this case. Now we can change those conditions. Look at verse 8. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not. To cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. Go back to chapter 4. Chapter 4. We just read these verses a few minutes ago. In chapter 4, verse 2, the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined in battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines. And they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. And when the people were come to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. I love this passage. Because it defines the difference between a relationship with God and a religion. It can't do anything. You know what they've learned by chapter 7 when they put away false gods and it's not religion anymore? You know what they learned? They learned, Samuel, would you pray to God that he will do something? You see that difference? Guys, yeah, sometimes we think, I'm a, just, just consider with me the things that we think will help us. If I read my Bible more, you ought to read your Bible more. But if you think that's your deliverance, you're wrong. I got to hear more preaching. Well, preaching is not necessarily a bad thing. Amen? If you use it right. But if you think listen to more preaching is going to fix your problem, you're wrong. 
God is who fixes these issues. I got to pray more. We ought to pray more. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Constantly be prayer. But if you think that the prayer is your deliverance, you're wrong. You know, that is a religious mentality. And it isn't things that deliver. It's him. He's a person. He wants to be involved. He can fix lives, change hearts, fix issues. But he wants to be recognized as the deliverer. He's the deliverer. They learned that. God knows our, our hearts. We have got to learn, Lord, it's you. It's you. So they said, cease not to pray that he will do something. You know, prayer is involved, but pray that he will do something. That God, he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. In verse, verse 9, and Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. Now, verse 9 is important. We're going to look at it in time to come in the next coming uh, chapters because we're going to find Samuel is a great intercessory for Israel. Constantly on their behalf is going to God. This is wonderful. And verse, verse 10, And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. <laughs> but the Lord. You see that? But the Lord. We're afraid. We're afraid of the Philistines. They've only ever defeated us, ever. In their lifetime, all we've ever seen is defeat, but the Lord. Isn't that something? You go to Ephesians chapter, chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible talks about the Lord. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. It talks about wearing in time past everything you were, but God. God. When the Lord fights for... You know what Paul said? If God be for us, who could be against us? I don't care what the number is. Right? Gideon went up against the Midianites. You couldn't count the Midianites. He went up with 300 people. You know what he did? Nothing. He watched. He watched God do something. God put their swords against their brethren. He watched them do that. That's what he got to do. You know what happens when we just yield to God? You don't, we don't have to get all... Oh, I got to do this and that. Watch what God does when you yield to God. It ain't about what you do. It's not about what I do. It's about what he did. So here, here's what happens, our passage. And Samuel, he was offering a burnt offering, and the Philistines drew near to battle against, but the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. God did something. It, it, this is, I'm so thankful that we weren't able to finish chapter 6 last time because chapter 6 showed us, okay, God will wipe out some people even if they're his, if they're disobedient and rebellious, okay? But that is not the heart of God. You turn your heart to God and watch what he will do to the enemy for you. That's, that's, the heart, that's what he desired. There are 50,000, 70 people who didn't have to die. If they just would have went to God sooner. You ever think of that? How many people in the Bible are dead because they just waited too long to understand their error? We are also guilty of these things. How many things in my life could be different if I had learned a lesson without such hardship? You ever wonder those things? I mean, you can't read it, but I can take and apply that to the future. I can't fix yesterday. I can fix tomorrow. I can be more yielded tomorrow. I can watch God's hand tomorrow. Okay, where were we? Verse 11. Oh, and the men of Israel went out of Mispe and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came to Beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mispe and Shin and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Come back to chapter 4. Look at verse 1. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside. Where's that? 
Ebenezer. Understand, verse chapter 4 is a defeat, a great defeat. Chapter 7 is a great victory in the same place, same enemy, same location, different outcome because we're serving someone different. Right? We, we, live, we live in a world where we, many of us, are, we are servants to our job or we are servants to name it. And some of that is required to live. But the outcome can always be different. It depends on, it's the same location. You can work with somebody in the same location, doing the same job and have a different outcome. They could be miserable and you can be joyful. Did you know that? That's crazy. I, I love that stuff. I just like, it makes me happy to know that something that somebody else can be miserable in, I don't have to be miserable in because I have something different than they have. I have a Holy Spirit of God indwelling me that can give me joy in the midst of any trouble or trial. And I, I fear for people who live their life in misery because it'd have to be that way. Almost like we picked it. We chose to have that outlook. We chose to say, you know what? I know God can give me victory, but then I would have to yield and submit. And I know we don't like the word submit. So instead of submitting and having joy, I'd rather not submit and be miserable. That is disgusting. Bless your heart. It doesn't make sense. Like, and I think, but here's, here's what I, I believe, and we're going to be finished. Samuel, Samuel's been judging Israel to a degree before this. There's a point in time where people have gotten low enough where that same message that could have been said in chapter 4 and ignored in chapter 4, we're ready to hear in chapter 7. And we're ready to do something about it in chapter 7. That's a shame because you think, man, that's a lot of misery. That's a lot of death we could have avoided. But some people have to learn the hard way. And that's what you find. They had to learn it the hard way. I personally want to be soft enough where I don't have to learn everything the hard way. But I know, I know me, and sometimes I do. I don't want it to be that way. We oughtn't want it to be that way. Lord, help me to be just yielded and submitted so that I can see victory. I was just talking before Sunday school this morning, I was talking to somebody about just how, how wonderful it is just to watch God do stuff. It is, but it is wonderful to watch God do stuff. I'm not saying, look what I have done for God. He could use anybody to do what he's used me to do. I'm a tool. And I'm fine with that. But it is amazing to be a vessel in the hand of the potter and watch him make it into something that glorifies and honors and magnifies him. It's wonderful. And to be, on, to be able to watch that is an incredible, incredible thing. But I fear there are a lot of people, Christian, you're saved, amen. You're missing out on a lot. Israel, in, in our, but man, look all they missed. But God's still good. He still delivered. Verse 13. So the Philistines were subdued. <laughs> and they came no more to the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. <laughs> What did it take to go from decades of defeat to victory? What did it take? Put away our junk. Say, we have sinned and turn to God. That's all it took. And defeat for decades is gone. And the hand of the Lord is no longer against Israel. It's against their enemies. And they didn't do anything. Like, they didn't do anything. This is so wonderful because it's the truth spiritually for us. I don't have to, I don't have to charge hell with a squirt gun to, to be blessed of God. I just have to say, Lord, you're right. I'm going to do it your way and watch. He does it all. Everything. It's incredible. Amen.
We pick up next week, continue our wonderful passage. Amen. Father, Lord, thank you so much for just the truths that we find in our passage today. Lord, what a wonderful blessing to see your hand, your might. Lord, please help us to see this. And we'll learn from the mistakes of others that we might not make them ourselves. Help us, Father, to follow you wholeheartedly. And Lord, what a blessing to watch you work. Thank you for the privilege we have to see it. I pray you'd help us now as we prepare for service. In Jesus' name, amen. Break.